Amaga Victoria respectfully acknowledges the first people of the land on which we make this podcast, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. We would like to acknowledge that museums, galleries and other arts and cultural organisations within Victoria sit on unceded lands. This is Closer Look, a podcast by Amaga Victoria. I'm Maria Pia Dunn. And I'm Cav P. It doesn't really feel like you're in a museum space. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, when I was a kid, I would come in here and I'd pretend that I was like on this like adventure somewhere. This was around when you were a kid? Trees swooshing in the background, you'd be surprised to know that we are standing in the middle of Melbourne Museum. In this episode of Closer Look, we look at the Forest Gallery at Melbourne Museum and interview Adam Young, an exhibition horticulturalist at the museum. We'll also hear from Andrea Cleland at Phillip Island Nature Parks to discuss Churchill Island and its relationship as both a historical and natural site. We look to answer the question in this podcast, if a tree falls in a museum, who is there to tell its story? Joining me as my delightful co-host for this tree trunk journey is Cav P. So Cav, are you ready to see some trees? Bring it on. (laughs) As soon as you come into the museum, you are like often bombarded with things that are very non-natural, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like to have the first thing that you come into to be like full of trees and green and like very earthy. I think that's something that's quite Mm. interesting. And it also brings up the question of what do we classify as nature? Are people part of nature? Are the things that people create part of nature because we created them? Walking into the exhibition, you are surrounded by mist from the waterways that go throughout the exhibition. It's full of greenery, a lot of ferns, a lot of different sorts of trees. We have two forest types represented in this space. The mountain ash forest, which we have represented at the top, through to the myrtle beach forest. And the mist, I guess, is kind of reminiscent of those wetter areas you see in the myrtle beach. My name's Adam Young. I'm exhibition horticulturalist here at Melbourne Museum, which means I look after garden spaces that also double as exhibition spaces. So we've got Children's Gallery, Gondwana Garden, Malari Garden, it's our first people's space, and the Forest Gallery as well, and they're all our garden exhibition spaces here. Adam was able to provide us with a rich understanding of the realities of working on and sustaining a nature-based exhibition comes to your job, what do you think are the main priorities that you hold on to when helping to maintain a space like this? There's lots of stuff around in terms of treating Phytophthora, the introduced pathogen, because that's been very devastating to lots of forests around the continent. Uh, Malaria not so much because it's a native pathogen, people don't want to get rid of it in um, forest environments and the bush, but it's a bit of an experiment as to how we deal with it in in a garden situation. You don't really feel like you're in a museum. You feel like you're in a nature trail or something. These gardens, um, I don't know if you know, but it's basically a big rooftop. So there's no soil beneath where we are. It's office spaces and all that sort of stuff. Not many museums that I think of that have like a bunch of trees that are Mm. to be viewed, I guess. And the first thing you see when you're in the museum, I always come here first before seeing anything else. In terms of the curation of a living exhibition, how much of the curation is something that you as horticulturists and other staff do and how much of it develops naturally? The plants kind of decide that for themselves a bit. Like this vine here um, that's kind of climbing up this uh, forest lamacia, but has also found its way right up that wire there. So going wherever that wants to go. None of these things are, are planned as part of the gallery space, but they just find a, a spot where they're comfortable and they, they just get going. It's a massive space and it's always so like meticulous. Yeah, and even like the birds, like, you know, whistling above. It's so yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, fun it's fact. Very... Apparently, a lot of people don't realise that the birds here are not just recordings. There are like literal birds flying ah, around here. There you go. Yeah. 
some of the females do sit on eggs and we have little chicks around that these little grey black puff balls follow the mother around. They just find their little nesting spaces and very close to paths as well. They don't seem that fussed about it. Adam was able to tell us that there's more than just plants lurking in the soil. The fungi keep surprising us. Like we don't know of all the different kinds of fungi we have here. We do have a bioluminescent fungi oh, that's kind sick. of blows at night. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, it's not something that visitors can see because no one's allowed in here after five o'clock. But um, we do have that somewhere. It comes in on the different mulches we bring into the forest as well. Um, I think every time you bring in a different kind of wood chip or something like that, that can bring in different fungi as well. A lot of what I understand about collections is that most of maintaining collections is just desperately trying to cut down on pests <laughs> and, you know, anything that's going to, you know, interact with your collections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas this is a, a living exhibition, yeah. so I'm guessing you would take um, a more lax approach towards insects and things like that because surely they would be part of the exhibition, right? Some of the insects we have here, the birds feed on. We get bees in here as well. When we've got some plants in flower, they're very popular with the bees. The gums are great for that, for local bees. We also have predatory insects that pop up in here as well. You see the eggs around the place. They're on these tiny stalks in rows with the little eggs at the end. And they probably don't, they don't eat every, <laughs> every bit of um, greenhouse thrift or whatever it is we have in the space, but they, they do a little bit. And I don't really want to muck around with that too much, so yeah. Why do you think it's important to have spaces like this in museums, like a live exhibition? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm a plant person, so I'm always going to say um, plants belong everywhere. Um, but I think specifically with a space like this and the forest types we're looking at, they're really good chances for people to come in and, um, fingers crossed, appreciate um, what they're seeing in these sorts of spaces. Another great example of a relationship between a museum and a natural site is Churchill Island. I'm Dr Andrea Cleland. I'm a, an oral historian, but I work with Phillip Island Nature Parks. I uh, was the museum curator at Churchill Island um, and I've just moved into the community engagement officer role where I work um, within the community and conservation team. I've always uh, loved history, but particularly personal history. So. Mm the stories of people that aren't necessarily at the forefront of public and um, national narratives. So it's interesting because it, it, I'm always, you know, listening to people's stories and working at how they can fit into into what we what we do. So um, I originally started as a volunteer and did a small oral history project on the um, Penguin Parade and how that um, developed over time. There was um, this growing of uh, the desire to protect the penguins, but at the same time, um, a growing tourism attraction. So from this, uh, um, you know, people wanting to come and see the penguins, we actually, you know, developed a penguin parade, which is now, it's, it's a great, it's a massive, wonderful uh, place where, um, you know, tourists come in from overseas, um, as well as domestic tourism. We were obviously got hit, hit a little bit during COVID, but that penguin parade um, actually, you know, contributes towards funding our other attractions, which are the Nobbies, Koala Conservation Reserve and Churchill Island. Um, and Churchill Island is particularly unique um, because it's a heritage listed island in itself and you've got historic houses. Um, we're actually accredited museum as well. So within all this conservation and um, protection of everything from hooded plovers to reintroducing uh, threatened species, we have this, 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 these heritage houses that are being preserved. And a lot of that's come at the forefront of volunteer making sure that the, the heritage and the buildings and the collection has been protected. Can you tell me a little bit more about Churchill Island? The, yeah, it's a really wonderful place, Churchill Island. So apart from it being this historically um, beautiful place, that um, takes its um, presence from the past, um, everything from um, the ancient moon. So we have 254 significant trees uh, listed on the National Tree Register, um, heritage gardens, um, as I mentioned, the historic house collection of farm machinery, collection of objects. Um, and we also work with the National Trust um, and borrow some of their objects to 
um, recreate what life was like uh, in Victorian times um, as the key kind of focus of the historic buildings. But yeah, so there's there's a wonderful, you know, built heritage um, aspect, but also, as I mentioned, um, the site of the um, first planting by Grant in 1801, um, moving through to um, 1872 when Baron von Mueller planted, um, he, was, he was quite a lover of um, uh, the island, he would come and visit. He had um, a fiancé down here. I think he had a lot of fiancés around the place, but it meant that we've got these wonderful trees all over Phillip Island, as well as um, we have this wonderful Norfolk Island uh, homestead tree that was planted when the house was built by Samuel Amos. Oh. The museum is um, the house itself. Mm. Um, so where we bring life to it is that in that interpretation of, um, you know, by dressing up, by engaging with the public, by relating those stories, um, by using um, um, audio stories, we start to use audio stories around the garden where people can QR code into the life of, say, Sister Campbell, who was there from the um, 40s to the 60s. So, yeah, we, it's, it's a really interesting way that we look at how we can bring that history to life in the, in the current times and, and, as I mentioned, pick up on the various stories of the people who have lived or owned um, Churchill Island over the, over the history over its history. Do you think more museums should embrace the natural environment and trees in their spaces? Yeah, I think there's very much, um, you know, that living aspect. I think trees are a, a wonderful um, aspect. If you, um, it, they're just, you, you, can, you know, a tree or a garden is, is very peaceful. Um, and I think, that, again, that, you know, how was a tree planted? Where did it come from? Where did its seeds come from? What can it tell us about how it got there? You know, we have, uh, you know, I think they reflect periods of, um, you know, in society, you know, you know, interest and time and, and travel and what was sometimes also fashionable. And they can also represent, you know, loss or, or, or longing if you put nature first, um, as you kind of lead, definitely is a way that you can tell that story rather than going, I guess, backwards of the, you know, the after effect of what, for example, you know, the Amos house is built on Muna stumps. So you could, again, take that story back to the Moonas and how important they are to uh, the Bunurong people. We do work very closely um, with the Bunurong Land Council. And we, we, we do work around how we can include stories and language. Are there any unique ways that you have included Churchill's natural environment in the museum? In our learning, some of our learning experiences, we do have actually a lot of taxi journeys, which seem kind of, um, you know, strange, but they actually, um, we, we were at the Island Whale Festival um, a couple of weeks ago, which was a very successful event. Um, and about 8,000 people came through um, through to the Whale Festival. Um, and taxi journeys are very tightly controlled in terms of their permits and how they can be um, you know, created and, and, and looked after and maintained. But um, it was what was interesting was all, I mean, as children came through, they all wanted to, you know, touch the taxi journeys. And there were some that were more fragile than others. So obviously we weren't able to... Um, assist with those but they they yeah they really were able to it was a really great way to um for children to ask questions about you know um, what's happened to this seal or what does this bird where does this bird come from or why is this you know um a, a threatened species or so forth so yeah so definitely having that um, in this case, they're not live, but they are exhibits of animals that were once live and the questions were, were they real, you know, et cetera, was a really um, engaging and gentle way, as surprisingly, um, for children to kind of engage. And then we could talk about what happens in the environment, how, how it can be sustainable and so forth. So I think, yes, definitely all those um, aspects of um, live exhibits work very much in a, in a museum space. That's all from us at Closer Look. The Forest Gallery is a permanent exhibition at the Melbourne Museum, open every day, 9 to 5, except Christmas Day and Good Friday. Churchill Island is open 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. every day. A huge thanks to Adam Young and Andrea Cleland for their contributions to this podcast. If you have any feedback, we would really love it, particularly as this podcast is a pilot program. So contact us with any feedback through Marga Victoria's Instagram, LinkedIn or Facebook. 
The sound mixing and recording of this episode was done by me, Maria Pia Dunn. Additional edits were made by Cav P, who joined me on this episode as my co-host. A huge thanks to Ashley Robertson and the larger Marga Victoria team for supporting this podcast. The music in this podcast is by Oleg Fedak from Pixabay. This is Closer Look. <laughs>